go onto the website. As Charles said, this is the, the last talk in this series on the Yoga Vichara. Um, six weeks from invocation to the path. Not bad. And it amuses me because um, back in the 1960s, at the height of the Burmese Vipassana movement, there were courses offered in the new Vipassana method in Burma and Thailand, but the ones in Burma were claimed to lead to the first path, Sotapana, stream enterer, within a month, almost guaranteed, without the need for jhana. And some centers gave certificates. Not many people know this, because it didn't last very long. There was a little, quite a lot actually, criticism outside Burma, that you could enroll and do a course for a month and get a certificate saying you are now um, fully realized the Tarpana. Anyway, it did happen. So where have we come to in these talks at this stage of our journey? Always at these times when I come to the end of um, talks, because it happened in the Bojangas. It reminds me of um, feelings I used to have, I mentioned it before, arriving at the end of a journey and the experience almost being like in parallel, like a parallel um, experience while setting out on the journey, arriving and setting out at the same time or or starting out and already being aware of arriving at the same time. I used to get this a lot um, on long-haul flights. And I think related to this is what we've talked about during some of these talks. Just that, for example, when we established Sati at the starting point in developing the Bojangas, or at the moment that we invoke the lineage, in developing the yoga vichara, meditators sometimes sense that the the whole way forward somehow is already present or presaged to some degree. That it's there somewhere. Not quite sure where. Almost as though it's ready to materialise at any time. And this reminds me of a, of a question that Naibhuman asked his meditators a long time ago, over 50 years ago, as to whether a person would actually start meditation at all if they knew what it would entail and where it might lead. And also particularly if they knew that at some point there'd be no going back. And now thinking about that, and thinking about what I just said about uh, already having a sense of um, something that you can't quite formulate. I think actually when meditators do decide to take up a practice and commit to that practice, it is because at some level there is a subtle understanding of, of what they're getting into, maybe what they're taking on. Um, what that means in detail may not arrive, may not be clear for them until 50 years later. But it's almost like a sense that somewhere there's an awareness that there is a path. There is another kind of reality beyond what we assume it to be ourselves, what we assume to be Paul Denison or whoever. Um, and that at some level we maybe sense that when we meet a first teacher or a first tradition. <clears throat> and thinking about the, the nature of the path, the Buddha referred to it after his enlightenment as an, an ancient path. And the quote is from the um, Nagara Sutta. Um, and what he said was, it is as if while traveling through a great forest, one should come upon an ancient path 
an ancient road traversed by people of former days. Even so have I, monks, seen an ancient path, an ancient road traversed by the rightly enlightened ones of former times. So something that already existed, even well before ages beyond the Buddha, this particular Buddha, an ancient path. And there's often a sense in the Yoga Vichara of an alternative reality, somewhere nearby, just off center, not quite in view. And it's one of the attractions, at least to, to it has been to me, of the Yoga Vichara, that quality, um, something fascinating in that idea that there can be something just out of our reach or beyond our range of consciousness. And of course, as you get more familiar with jhana, this fits exactly with the, the phrase fine material sphere. So as you let go of all the anchors of sensory consciousness, the understanding of other levels of experience to do with, particularly to do with feeling, and to do with metaphor and the symbolic realm become very interesting. And it's through those levels that we perceive that there's something nearby, something intriguing, fascinating, which leads us on. And things we've talked about in this series of talks are also you know, related to that. So when we talked about the Arupa Jhanas, for example, the second Arupa jhana, the infinite consciousness, is already somehow present when we're practicing the first Arupa, infinite space. It's present, but it's not attended to. So we don't subjectively experience it, but as you get more familiar with the object or infinite space, where there appears to be no subject or subjectivity, you still realize after a while that it has to be there somewhere in counterpart. Quite a different kind of experience to the black and white, uh, this or that of sensory consciousness. <coughs> and then a little bit later on in the Arupa Jhanas, as we were talking about last week, the, the whole nature of Rupa Jhana and Arupa Jhana we start to realize is very interrelated, almost like two sides of uh, a different kind of reality, interdependent. One can't really be conceived of without the other. How can you conceive of formless without understanding form? But then also, as you start to become familiar with formless, the vice versa, that you can't really conceive of formless without form, but also form without some awareness that there can be a formless. Or then, again last week, the realization that nothingness, the idea of nothingness, the third Arupa Jhana, is actually meaningless by itself, without the context of being not something. There has to be an absence of somethingness so again, these are fascinating kinds of, of um, use of words. It's a different kind of um, reaching for meaning, not just through concrete, black and white uh, meanings, but something, something more felt, um, direct experience, <coughs> some would say. And then again, if you go a bit further than this, the idea that happiness, can't exist, can't arise, we can't understand it outside the context of suffering. And if we take that further, we realize the interdependence of happiness with suffering leads to the awareness that that interdependence is rooted in craving and attachment. And of course, the whole basis of the, of the Buddhist dependent origination. But that opens the way to the idea 
that there might be a way of breaking that cycle of interdependence, of happiness and suffering, and that cycle that we live within. So what we've been talking about in the Bhujanga, in sorry, the Yoga Bacharas, is not so different to what we talked about in the Bhujangas. Both are ways of formulating something about the path, path to realizing the ending of suffering. The Bhujangas do this by talking in terms of factors of that path. Whereas the Yoga Vichara is more concerned with the practical realities, the practical application of those factors. How do you actually do it? Which is a big question. Because as we've seen in these talks, it's not possible to rely on thinking. We can't think ourselves into jhana, and certainly not into the path. So in this talk, how do we how do we even approach talking about the path? So keep that in mind that even though I'm talking about the path somehow, what does it really mean? Because those are at one level just words. At some point, the experience is going to be maybe quite different level to words. <coughs> So in both models of the Bojangas and the Yoga Vichara, jhana meditation is absolutely central. And this was, this was expressed many, many times by the Buddha in repeated in the suttas. And one example of this is the, this quote from the um, Dhammapada. There is no jhana for one without wisdom nor wisdom for one not practicing jhana. He who has both jhana and wisdom is truly in the presence of Nibbana. And there are many, many more examples of that in the, in the suttas, which makes it all the more extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary, that a movement could be so successful in the 1950s and 60s onwards, saying that jhana was not necessary for the path. The Yogavachara, the way it formulates the practice, is in some ways quite similar to the way the Tibetan um, tradition of Tibetan Buddhist yoga formulates the practice. In the, same, in the sense that there is a, a way an actual accelerated way to develop the path. This is very explicit in the Tibetan, one of the Tibetan um, practices. And the reason that the similarity in the Yoga Vachara is the centrality of jhana. In the formula for developing the first Rupa Jhana, the phrase comes up and I couldn't remember what the words were last time. So I think, checking it up, the words come up in the beginning of the transcendental jhana chant, apachaya garming. And it refers to a dispersal of kama, that somehow jhana, letting go of sensory consciousness, frees deep, deep previous experiences in, held in memory or held in the body, which can be released more easily because they're not trapped into the, the cycle of sensory consciousness. So this dispersal of karma can speed up the whole process. Hence the idea of um, a potential accelerated path, even to the point um, being described in the Tibetan tradition, that this is an accelerated path that potentially can be completed in one lifetime. I suppose thinking about some of the comments people have made during these talks at the end of the practice, there's a kind of glimpse of what this means in practice. You know, some people have described emotions, quite strong emotions coming up after practice, sometimes without a clear cause just the emotion. 
with the sense that it's coming from somewhere very deep. And also sometimes people have um, images, almost like dreams or daydreaming. Someone mentioned something from that area last week. And I think these are examples of what becomes freed. And at those times, also what's come out of the, these talks and the discussions is how important and helpful it is to be part of a group like this or a group that you meet with regularly. It helps you face these experiences without being afraid, without needing to try and control them or push them away or on the other hand, become attached to them. You know, sometimes there's a, a slight pull to become attached even to a painful experience, never mind a pleasant one. But the, the task at the end of meditation when these feelings come up or images come up is to be able to fully experience them as long as they last because they will fade without any attachment or grasping or fear. And that's how the past, whatever the details originally were, and you may never know fully, eventually dissolve. <coughs> the study of the meditators that we did in the EEG recordings, the brain study, was the first direct evidence of how jhana actually does allow a meditator to disengage from sensory consciousness. You know, the only direct um, demonstration of that, apart from the descriptions, many, many descriptions in the Buddhist suttas, of course, that jhana is a, is a separation from um, sensory attachment. But the EEG study shows actually that this is real. That as you do it, as you start to develop jhana from the very beginning, you can see changes, big changes in the brain activity, in the brain networks. And in Buddhist terms, it's the disengagement from sensory consciousness that opens the way to jhana and that eventually opens the way to the path. And one of the things that came out of the EG study and kind of parallel discussions with, with neuroscientists, um, informal discussions with one or two, not published. It's been very interesting to recognize that in their way, neuroscientists have been investigating um, the sensory consciousness, what we regard as sensory consciousness. And the two together turn out to have a lot of a lot of resonances. And for example, this is the traditional Buddhist model of dependent origination. And it's actually a description of how sensory consciousness works. It's a description of our experience living in the sensory world. The starting point in this, some of you know a lot about this already, probably more than me. The starting point can be anywhere, anywhere around the cycle. And there are two ways of um, looking at this. One is the, the forward order, where something is a supporting condition for the next. So Dukkha is a supporting condition for Avijja, a sort of supporting condition for the arising of Sankara, Vijnana, etc. Or in the reverse order, that every one of these factors, Vijnana, for example, in the reverse order, has a supporting condition, namely the previous one, namely Sankara. So it can be, it can be looked at in many different ways. So usually the starting point is Avijja, ignorance or not knowing. This leads to a kind of restlessness. There's a restlessness in not knowing. That something has to fill the gap. And there's an urge, that urge to know something activates awareness of, you could say, this 
activates and when appearance or kind of formations. Which in this model, in the Buddhist model, leads to consciousness vinyana, subject object, nama rupa. The six the sense bases lead to contact with the outer world, which in, in, immediately arouses feeling of that contact. Is it pleasant or unpleasant? It leads to a craving to either get rid of that contact or to hang on to it, craving, attachment. The process continues, it, it is becoming, it goes further. A whole new cycle might start, a series of births, and, and again the arising fire. Continuous, non ending cycle that we live in in sensory consciousness. And in the neuroscience model, I showed very briefly last time, is like this. At least it's, as far as I can understand it, it's like this. This is my interpretation. Um, in the neuroscience model, the inputs on the left, sensory inputs from the outer world, here, the left, and at the bottom, sensory inputs from the body, touch, all the sensations that we um, mostly unconsciously feel of the organs in the body, the interior interoceptive sensations. These are inputs. And there are obvious parallels here to the, the Buddhist model of the sense bases, contact with the world. And they're processed here on the right. These inputs are processed in relation to past experience, lots of what are called priors in neuroscience. Um, in, in psychoanalysis, we call them um, feeling memories, reciprocal, memories of reciprocal interactions with other people, mostly, some pleasant, some unpleasant. The inputs are processed in relation to priors, very fast, mostly unconsciously, leading to a series of possible options for, for action. So the priors in the neuroscience model would correspond to the kind of formations in the Buddhist model that in that interaction, feelings are required, implicit. So feelings arise just as in the Buddhist model. And there has to be at that point, some evaluation as to benefit to the organism, to ourselves in terms of future action, which, which action is the least painful or the most pleasant. So there's an evaluation and there's a relation somewhere to craving or attachment, liking or disliking. And a choice of action arises, which would be a moment of becoming in the Buddhist model. That feeds back into becoming part of the prior experience. New inputs come along and resonate now with the updated prior experience, the updated camera formations, leading to other choices of action, one chosen, the feedback, and the cycle goes on and on and on. This is actually, you know, quite encouraging that the two models, the kind of ancient model of Buddhism, can relate to something which is actually very recent in neuroscience, the last 10 years. And so the idea of a default sensory consciousness becomes common to both. The difference in neuroscience is there's no real evidence prior to the EEG study of meditation that there is an alternative consciousness. So, so far, those two models of sensory consciousness, that's the what we might call the mundane world. And even in the early stages of developing the first Rupachana, a meditator begins to get a sense of a, of a deeper peace, a deeper potential freedom from all those processes that go on and on, round and round. Processes of just endlessly doing and keeping it going basically keeping sensory consciousness continuous in time and space, and basically also our subjective experience of I exist, I'm doing, I'm doing something. 
But gradually, as jhana approaches, and the meditator becomes able to stay with the stillness for a while, the longer, then it becomes even more clear that there's a different kind of um, experience or consciousness nearby. At first, maybe briefly, but more familiar, we get, when we get more familiarity with it, it becomes possible to keep it going longer. When it really becomes complete in moments of one-pointedness, it becomes so different to sensory consciousness, in the sense that time stops, that the anchors, the idea of our identity, no longer quite fits. And it becomes clear to a meditator that sensory consciousness, everyday experience, is not, not at all the whole of reality, including the sense of who we, who we are. At this point, if the first Rupa Jhana becomes fully developed, it can be regarded as a first taste, a kind of temporary experience of the first of the path. If you think about it, the first Sotapana path is the point where the idea of our self changes. Uh, assumptions that we are Lord Ellison or whoever are no longer quite meaningful. So a wrong view of self dissolves. Doubt and attachment to rituals, to rites, um, also dissolve to be replaced by a deeper confidence that, that, this is, that this reality gives a glimpse of something we call the path, different to our everyday experience. So this is a temporary experience. It's a temporary experience of something like what it means to be the Satapana. And it's held in balance for a while by the power of the stabilized Vitaka and Vichara. And eventually it fades, and we come back to sensory consciousness. Now we move, or if a meditator moves to the second group of jhana, they're required to develop a much greater mastery of liking and disliking, or mastery of letting go of attachment, much more so than is required for the first group of jhana. And in the second group of jhana, this is first felt in relation particularly to bodily disturbance, BT. And the meditator learns how to calm this down back into the samadhi by passively tranquilization. And when this becomes a familiar process, you know, the kind of completion phase of the second rupa jhana, even the very slightest degree of disturbance in the body that could be an obstacle to peacefulness and stillness is immediately tranquilized by Pasadi until the samadhi just becomes peaceful and the body is no longer separate and disturbed. And in this model of the passing jhana, the jhanas, the second group of jhana can be regarded as the temporary experience of the Sakadagamin path where a person who has attained the Sakadagamin path has weakened the power of liking and disliking, of hatred and greed, dosa and loba, so that if they do arise at any point, they can be quickly tranquilized. So the Sakadagamin path has got this intriguing description that what is let go of are the same factors as the first path, Sotapana. Identity, uh, delusion, um, attachment and doubt. Attachment to rites and ritual and doubt. But in the Sakadadagamin path, in addition, there's a weakening of dosa and loba. Now in the third group of jhana, the meditator goes further letting go not just of any disturbance to the body, but any disturbance to the, to the mind. The experience is one of 
completely undisturbed sukha. There's no room for any disturbance in the body. But there's also no room to any intrusion into that completely all-encompassing happiness of sukha. And the model here is that this is a temporary experience for a meditator of the third path, the Anagamin path, the non-return path. An Anagamin in daily life is someone who has totally eradicated dosa and loba. In the temporary experience of the third Rupa Jhana, they simply can't intrude for the duration. But of course it's temporary. Meditator comes out and is back into processing um, all the features of sensory consciousness. And then in the fourth Rupa Jhana, Samadhi becomes so complete, all attachment is let go, even attachment to happiness. And we refer to it as upenka, equanimity, not just not just peacefulness, or, or the kind of kind of superficial equanimity of being undisturbed on that level, but its opaca is very close to wisdom, imperturbability, and freedom from attachment. Is the quality of the fourth rupajana, which can be regarded as the temporary experience of the fourth path the arahat path, no more attachment, freedom from attachment, all residual attachment, but of course it's temporary. The four paths on the left, Sotapana, Sakadagamin, Anagamin, Arahat. Um, then the, the fetters that are abandoned in the Sotapana path is false view of self, doubt, attachment to ritual, or intriguingly attachment to asceticism believing that some kind of denial or paying a price through asceticism can help your practice, which is a kind of ritual. Those are let go of, and they're part of what are called the lower fetters. The second Agamian path is the same three, plus sense, desire and ill will are weakened. The Anagamian path, sense, desire and ill will are totally abandoned. Those are all the lower fetters. And then the final path, all the residual fetters, attachment to the Rupa Jhanas, attachment to the Arupa Jhanas, conceit, restlessness and ignorance are all let go of. <clears throat> restlessness is an interesting one. It's not the same kind of restlessness as in the initial hindrances. It's more a kind of subtle attachment still, the same subtle attachment that underlies conceit and ignorance. And the three, in, in a way, the eight and nine and ten, if you look into it more closely, are very, very interrelated. And the rebirths, in the case of the Sotapana, traditionally, are, depend on three kinds of character type. One is a person who has done a certain amount of work in meditation but is otherwise still got a lot to do and there may be six rebirths before the final one in which realization is completed six rebirths in high realm and a final human birth <coughs> supposedly this is a person of weak faculty the middle situation is the person who has got more experience, particularly more experience in jhana. And we'll have two or more, two or three more human rebirths before completing the path. And then the person of keen faculty will be reborn once more and then complete everything in that one life. The second, the Garmin is one more birth as a human, which is not unlike the the keen faculty, so on it. The Anagamin is one more birth in a heavenly realm, the pure abodes, whereas the Arahant is no more rebirth. Or again, summarizing some of the things mm -hmm. that we're just talking about. The first Rupa Jhana, this disengagement from sensory consciousness is such a profound experience 
if the genre is fully developed, that it equates to a change of lineage from century consciousness to genre, to genre consciousness. Change of lineage is Gotrabu in Pali. The second Rupa Jhana, again, any disturbance is mastered by Pasadi, and any tendency for greed and hatred to disturb a meditator is quickly tranquilized. And for once returning, this is what happens in daily life. If you observe a person who has reached this path, something can still disturb them, can make them briefly very angry, but he'll be quickly tranquilized back into equanimity. The third Rupa Jhana, again, there's no more in room for dose and loba, and no falling back. And this is the temporary experience of the Anagami path, fourth Rupa Jhana of the Arahat path. Now the Arupa Jhanas in the Yogavachara tradition, and again, I'm not sure where this, um, if, if at all, this is written down. But it's regarded, certainly in the oral tradition, and you come to experience, or you come to understand it uh, from practice, that the Arab pajamas take you even closer to the path. So that the, the first root pajama, which is held together by the Takabichara, it's held together by the nimitta. It's a hell state. But in the infinity of space, which becomes unbounded, unlimited, there is no intrusion into this temporary experience, potentially. No intrusion, potentially. So if the experience really does become all-encompassing with no boundaries, it is regarded in the in this yoga vachara tradition that it can become transcendental. The jhana, the sotapanna experience becomes permanent. Similarly, the infinity of consciousness, in comparison to the second group of jhana, which is temporary. This may be to begin with temporary in the infinity of consciousness, but if it really does become perfected and with absolutely no boundary, in that sense, it's possible that the Sakadagami path will become complete and permanent. And the same with the third and fourth path. Don't try and hang on to these. They're just words, you know. You can always come back to them. It's always a dilemma for me, you know, giving giving this kind of talk, which I've resisted for a long time, <laughs> that for example, in the early years when I was practicing, I can remember reading in some of the books on Buddhism and meditation, like the Visuddhimagga, actually, probably particularly the Visuddhimagga, which is a very, very weighty um, tome, indeed, for a beginner to look at. I remember reading the descriptions that at the moment of realization, the moment of experience in the past, all the factors of the Eightfold Path become clear to the meditator in one moment. That all the stages of dependent origination will be understood by the meditator at that moment. And I found this incredibly discouraging, actually, um, as well as being almost impossible to think. Because also this was the time when I'd, I'd, um, I'd left academic work. And the, one of the reasons I left academic work is that I felt that I'd done enough thinking for a whole lifetime. And um, I did something quite different. Very little thinking. 
So I have actually quite an aversion to all these kinds of descriptions and models. I only came to really value some of the ideas only if they were based on meditation experience. And I think my view is perhaps slightly extreme because I know that other people get a lot of value out of these models and studying them. But, you know, each to their own. So I'm going to take a chance and show this last uh, slide, which... Uh, so the bottom part is the dependent origination the basic way we exist in sensory consciousness. The rest of this is a model which I drew up probably about 25 years ago and didn't really fully understand what I was drawing up at the time. So haven't really done much with this. One or two of you will, will have seen it before uh, in some of the yoga vachara retreats or practices we've taken. Dukkha, suffering, is the point where you break out. It's like Naibuma's comment, you know, when you complain about nothing happening in your meditation. Have you suffered enough? And so Dukkha is the motivation, finally, for someone to look for a way out or an answer to the, probably the deepest question we're faced with as human beings. And if you turn to meditation, this first phase following Dukkha is actually developing Rupa Chana. So you meet a teacher, you hear something about jhana meditation. If you have faith or if your teacher evokes some confidence, you start practice. You develop sati. There may be an invocation through your teacher of a lineage and you feel a bit happier. Particularly, you feel happier as you start to disengage from sensory consciousness, flattening, which leads to the first Rupa Jhana. The next stage is the second Rupa Jhana, mastering PT, Pasadi. The third Rupa Jhana, developing an understanding, Sukha, happiness, bliss. And finally, letting go of attachment to happiness and bliss with the fourth Rupa Jhana, Samadhi and Upeka. So the Dukkha motivates someone to follow this path through the Rupa Jhanas. Then if they take up, if the path has not arisen, which it may well do, for someone with all the requisites, if it hasn't arisen and you take up the Arupa Jhana, it will take you even closer to that point where the path can emerge. <laughs> So the first Arupa Jhana, infinite space, realizing that you can totally let go of your self-consciousness, subjectivity, into complete absorption into infinite space, a completely different reality, quite different in its scope to the first Rupa Jhana, no limits. And this arouses the quality of Sotapana, something completely new, with no doubt about the reality of it, because there's no limits, no boundary, no limitation. So if that becomes complete, the knowledge and vision of this new experience becomes complete, which is the, which is the Sotapana path permanently. The second Arupajana becoming familiar with the infinite consciousness and the fact that that can exist without any kind of object but if you take an object you're immediately limited and vulnerable to restriction you're no longer free the whole process of subject object loses its enchantment 
hence libido disenchantment. And the second path, Sakadagami, can emerge fully. And you can follow the same line through to Viraga and find the complete freedom, Vimuti. And the last one is the looking back on what's been done. Knowing what's been done, what, what's been completed. A bit like when we talked in the Bujangas, the image for Upeka, the Buddha Rupa for, for Upeka, was related to the Buddha after his enlightenment, standing, walking some distance away, and looking back for seven days at where he'd come from, where he'd sat, where he'd experienced enlightenment, looking back and knowing exactly what's been done. And there's nothing left to do. That's a lot of talk. And is it possible to, to, have, to have heard all that and to take something in and then to completely let it go and practice? So there's this kind of deliberateness in, in giving you a lot of information because that's the test. Yeah. How much can you understand and take it in and then completely let it go? It's a little bit like the, you know, the, the picture I showed, I'll put it on when we practice in a minute, the picture of the Yoga Vichara wax taper practice. It's a pity we can't do that online, and I'm, I hope that at some point all of you can have the experience of doing it um, directly in the group. Because the wax taper practice is very, very helpful. It takes the person of a teacher out of the equation. And just like I'm telling you to take out of the equation anything I've just said. And you sit and a candle is lit, a candle resting on cross bamboo pieces above a bowl, a monk's bowl. And the, the candle represents your body, your trunk, and the bamboo, cross bamboo, that the candle rests on, are like your four limbs. So the candle and the bamboo is, is you. And the flame above it is your flame of consciousness. And if you could look closer at this, the cross bamboos are tied with what in Thai is called Sai Sin. It's the thread of sila. It's the same thread you find your wrist with sometimes in a puja. It consists of nine threads of raw cotton. So it's all very symbolic. The bowl underneath it is like the mother's womb, where we come from. So you light the candle. At some point, the candle burns down and the weight is released. And if you've been able to give up all expectations, which is the same as what I just said, forgetting everything I've just said, letting it all go, completely at still at ease, the weight drops, and it is a very sharp break to your stream of consciousness. And if you're experienced, then it doesn't jolt you back into thinking and sensory consciousness. At that point, you can move into the next jhana, the change of lineage. Or the change of lineage might evoke the path. Not all that different. If you're not expecting it and you, you can let go of all expectation. And if everything is in place, then this is what is said when the path can arise at any time. Maybe not in this practice, maybe in everyday life, maybe when you don't expect it. It actually helps when you get quite old, you know. It's an interesting experience getting, getting a bit older. You noticed I say very carefully, a bit older. I'm not saying very old. Just a little bit old. Very interesting experience because 
as, um, as your short-term memory becomes unreliable, the mind is very unreliable. In a very strange way, your long-term memory at the beginning becomes profoundly deeper, vividly so. You know, you may forget what you what you intend to do in the next five minutes or what you did in the last five minutes. But memories from even the first year of life start to become clearer. And it becomes clear that we never forget anything, actually. Which I hope you take as some kind of confidence that if you forget everything I just talked about, nothing is lost. Because the other thing that also happens that you realise as you get older is that nothing is wasted. In a very strange way, all the experiences, whether even the very unpleasant ones, um, are not wasted. And realising this is quite interesting. It's a little bit like what's happened for some people after the practices during these talks. Emotions or deep feelings coming up that you don't know quite where they've come from. But you know they might have been actually quite painful, very painful originally. But they don't any longer have that power over you. And in a strange way they become quite useful. In the same way that, you know, the counterpart between suffering and happiness. Um, if you have experienced enough suffering, maybe you start to really understand what happiness is. And then further than that, freedom from the whole pattern of craving or wanting one or the other. So it helps when you get a bit older. So I think it's time to, to practice for a while and I will sound the bell to begin practice. something one is not yet aware of or um, has some inkling of um, and, and I was wondering if there is any benefit um, at moments of almost kind of tuning into that um, whether if one sort of almost tries to become aware of something about nature, whether whether that is useful, just just kind of momentarily, now and again. But uh, that's uh, the thought or the question. Mm. Mm. I think it's a it's a very good point that. Um, Apologies for responding. I tell people not to respond for the first three or four, but it is an interesting point about what happens at those moments. Yes, I would say it can be quite helpful to be aware of that there's a sort of openness to a possibility there. You know, it's a little bit like when I said, forget about everything I said. Nevertheless, what I said has led to a certain sense of quality, depending on you. And that can actually lead you forward. It's a little bit like, you know, the moment of developing the first Rupa Jhana. We touch it, and then we come slightly to the threshold of it. And if you get used to that point and you go back in, it's rather like the quality you're talking about. Um, so there is something about it in getting familiar to the fine material level 
uh, it can be actually quite healthy. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Everyone else can say something with no response from me. <laughs> um, I found that um, when we've been doing these practices, that when we finish them at the end, there's um, that quality of uh, where I do the practice, I look out because our house is a bit higher over a square and can see activity going on below. That that's almost too much stimulation. That um, just looking at something really, really simple like a flower or um, a candle is absolutely enough. And it takes a while to be able to um, adjust to all those sense impressions coming in again. So. And be interesting in whatever deepest level of practice you've gone to, to after a while in that, just to be open to the possibility of stopping. Just a complete stopping. And to see if you can rest in that for a while. But then it's also interesting to notice what parts of the mind wanting to think, okay, enough of that, want to come back to something. <laughs> and sometimes, okay, it's maybe the energy of rung down and it's a sensible, you need to come back out. But, so, but sometimes you can see that wanting, wanting the familiar to come back. Yes. Just, yeah. Um, just following what Peter was saying from the experience of the practice, I was the the a quote that Rumi's teacher had given <clears throat> says something like, "I was raw, then I was cooked, and now I am burnt." And there's a sense with that I in the practice of somehow wanting to hold on to something mm. of that experience or that development. And it's just interesting to be with that eye throughout the practice with a really kind way of just seeing it popping up again and again, of wanting to make more of something rather than letting something go. I find that um, interesting um, because you can see the you know, you get that taste of that joy, that liberation of not having to feed it all the time. Just like when we, in the talk, when we looked at things, um, you know, I thought about with dukkha and suffering going to, if you go around that way to birth, it's like sometimes you want to replace the dukkha by something else. So you go into something else. And it's just interesting, that sense of the, that counterintuitive sense of just, not having to feed the eye in any way, but just being free of that. And I was also reminded of that sense of when you go to the beginning, you know at the beginning that there'll be an ending. And how when the Buddha was born, I have a little tiny Buddha that I got in Numbini, and the Buddha, when he was born, saying with that joy, this is my last life. And that sense of that sense of knowing something at the beginning, even if you don't, you've got no idea how it's, how it's going to pan out. And certainly I think uncertainty brings with it that open-mindedness. Um, it's something we feel uncomfortable with because we want to know, we want answers, we want strategies or lists or techniques, but that uncertainty brings, it, it brings liberation and openness. That's it. The, um, both the, the talk and the practice was, had that very strong sense of reminding of that um, phrase, which I'm sure I went completely correctly um, state of this fathom-long body, 
you know, that is the arising of the world and the ceasing of the world and, or the passing away of the world, but also at the stopping of the world. And I had never really thought of the way in which the Rupa or the or Arupa connected to the path in that kind of way and very strong sense of um, uh, like the nested like those Russian dolls nested so in this body just in this body is all that sort of opening out and um, truly remarkable that that could be so. Um, so the very strong feeling of that, that quality. So the sense of even if one kind of remembers the first time you sat down to practice, the, that sense of it, of being in a different space and how over time um, that can unfold to that kind of richness and, and, and uh, freedom, hopefully. And that's, um, it is quite remarkable, <laughs> was the feelings that came up. Um, the other thing I was um, interested in, Paul, was um, when before we did the practice, you said um, <coughs> about knowing you are part of a group doing the same thing. Um, and I've not heard of it quite phrased like that before, but um, it's interesting. I found that very useful, almost just as a sort of form of words. Um, and also um, during this sort of meeting, I suppose, knowing knowing one is part of a group of people also <coughs> um, following a kind of similar path. Um, anyway, sorry, I found that a helpful form of words. What we're talking about today is it's led to a different quality in the in this in this comment and the discussion, coming to a point where almost that, like there's a space which doesn't want to be disturbed, and I think it's to do with how do you grasp the point where if you do it's to do with letting go, but letting go are not quite the right words. Uh, Peter was trying to trying to get at it too, about stopping. But then stopping is also not quite the right choice of words. It's very, very difficult to put words on the point of transition and gotrabu. You can't put words on gotrabu, change of lineage, because it's not conditioned by the prior moment. So how do you, how does that work? And interestingly, the quality in the questions coming to a point where uh, there's nothing com nothing apparently coming up, and yet there's a strong feeling that something is shared, is, is very appropriate to what we're trying to talk about in this last talk about the path, because it is... Um, it isn't subject to the usual language. But yet, there is some sense of it that comes up in the lack of comments, sometimes, the space. It 
It also occurs to me, you know, that there's a lot of experience in this group, or as a wide range, from a few years up to a lot of years of experience. And even for the, when you were very experienced, even when people are very experienced, sometimes it, um, it's a surprise for what to find that there's yet another level of letting go or another level of um, practice beyond what we've assumed. And so it can happen right at the beginning in the, you know, in the first Rupa Jhana, the kind of touching something, stillness, and then withdrawing slightly to reflect on it. And to begin with, that reflection is crude, like um, thinking, you know, sensory consciousness. It's dropping right back out to sensory consciousness because the two are very, very close. Touching jhana, and you're then back in thinking. Then you get a little bit more confident in the feel, the subtle feel of, of stillness, of jhana, and you can slightly withdraw like you do in the stillness at the end and still be very, very close and in a way partly in it. And those are interesting moments because quite a lot of insight can come up. And that's a little bit of what, not entirely, but some of what Peter was saying about realizing even at a much later stage of practice, you know, maybe the, the higher Rupa Jhanas or even the Arupa Jhanas, you can still notice that tendency to slightly withdraw and there's an urge to reflect on it, which can be very interesting. Um, Anne was also talking about the same thing because it arouses a lot of in insight. And, and it's two-sided. It, tell, it tells us that there's a way of uh, using jhana, the threshold, of not, not letting go totally into deep, deep absorption. Um, but in a way, feeling around the threshold to allow insight to come. And that's, that's sometimes very helpful. But also it highlights how even for very experienced meditators, you realize at some point later that that threshold of how, to what extent have you actually let go into jhana fully? Because that's the question in this last talk. Is everything ready? to fully experience not just jhana, but actually the path. And it highlights, actually, probably a lot of the time, we don't fully um, develop as much as we might be capable of. And I think that's partly, as I said some, some point earlier in these talks, that this is a lay tradition. And we have to balance the everyday responsibilities of life to ourselves as well as our family as well as what we do in practice so it's actually probably very appropriate that we're unconsciously managing this all the time but there are occasions like today or in a group intensive practice where you realize that actually a lot of the time we hover around the point of allowing ourselves to really commit and let go of the last vestiges of control, the last vestiges of the I, I am and I do. And it's not any longer just to do with fear, which it may well be to begin with. You know, it's quite a scary thing to let go of all those anchors, which is why we're very careful, why teachers are very careful uh, when, when to start teaching the Arupa Jhanas. But even when you've got a lot more experience, um, it can still happen that you realize you haven't fully let go. And there may be good reasons why not. And no need to feel guilty about that. But it highlights that there is more if the time is right. 
very nearby that you could. Which is also one of the lessons from, from what's been coming up in the last 10 minutes. That this may not be the occasion where you fully let go to what capacity you're capable of, but it won't be forgotten. And it's a confirmation that it's not far away. And it's also interesting about the threshold of insight, because what I was saying about the jhanas being um, effectively temporary experiences of the path. If you look at your own practice, you know this to be true. Every time you practice, whether it's the first, second, third or fourth rupa jhana or whichever arupa jhana, and you stay with the stillness at the end of the practice, that experience of staying with the stillness without thinking about it too much, then you come out. You won't forget the quality of that stillness, which is will stay with you for a while and is a quality of the one of the paths. So even though you, we can't maintain it all the time in lay life, it's not far away. And it's why, you know, sometimes people feel that there may not be time in this life or the opportunity to complete it. But there will come a time, you know, when you're in a, a, a strict and intensive practice where you might. Or there will also come a time when you're very well prepared at the moment when you die. So the beginning of journey and the end of journey, you know, this life is one journey, the archetypal journey from birth to death one breath to begin with, an in-breath to begin with, and an out-breath to end it. Somehow within all that, everything is relevant and nothing is lost in what you experienced. Even though you can't necessarily control the moment where you fully develop complete absorption in one of the jhanas or the path. You may know at some sense, at some level, that it's very, very close by, and that's probably often enough. And then at the right moment, you know exactly what to do. Or it may really surprise you and come, you know, even outside practice. Um, if it isn't fear, then they're now thinking, what is it? And. Uh, it's sort of almost as though it comes to come to a point where it's it's one thing or the other, and uh, and the word choice came to mind actually. So so it, it's uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just a comment <laughs> or a question. I'm not sure. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> so it's a good. It's a good. It's a good question. You're saying that if it's not fear, then it may not be fear certainly not crude fear, and you're aware, you're aware that somewhere there is a potential, a threshold, and there may be a choice. That's the background thought. But yeah. the, the, the choice conventionally in sensory consciousness depends on wanting or not wanting. Mm. Whereas in the, in the jhana or the path moments, what is the nature of the choice compared to that? Because if it's, if it's the same kind of basis of wanting or not wanting, it won't work. But yet there may be something at that point which allows you to just go there, not based on wanting or not wanting. What would it be? And there's no answer in sensory consciousness. But you're on the right, you're exactly on the right path, as it were. <laughs> that this will make sense at some point where the choice becomes just going there with no trace of fear not wanting or wanting greed or craving the right time will just take you there and it's very nearby when that kind of thought comes up but it may be very nearby for 10 years <laughs> <laughs> Or the next moment, the, the sense of time is very, very deceptive. You know, we, we start off practicing, you know, 50 years ago or whatever, and you think you have to sit 
Well, you do have to sit for at that time for more than one minute, certainly, to get used to it. And then you may develop the habit of sitting for 30 minutes or even 60 minutes. If that becomes ingrained, every time we come to sit, there's an unconscious assumption that it's going to take time. And now again, that is sensory consciousness. But what if, what if all that is the illusion of sensory consciousness and you come into practice and it's possible to just go there? You know, which is why it was so strange for people to hear Booman start to do exactly that when he led practices 10 years ago. The sense of time belongs to sensory consciousness. The sense of time and perception in, in, in jhana is not quite the same. So your point about choice and just and it really going there, what is it based on? It's very interesting to hold that somewhere without thinking about it at the back of your mind. I was noticing um, since last week, um, sort of related to what I think you said this before, just the, uh, the quality of wanting to take ownership over my experience that something is happening. It's almost like a part that's wanting to, to register and then to make it my experience. Or this is, this is part of my experience. And then that sets up time, because then it's a kind of a sequence of one experience to the next experience, yeah. the next one, and they're all mine, and they're all part of who I am, etc. And of course, that's, it's not that it's not part of this, but somehow that taking ownership over it creates something. And I was just wondering or noticing how there's something about the peacefulness and the kind of sense of freedom that you can taste at those moments that allows a choice to stop doing that, to stop taking ownership of the experience. To, you could say to just let it be order or to, to, to not let it be mine or to not have to make it mine comes something from that peacefulness and that and sense of, of, is it freedom? I don't know, of sort of openness maybe. And all, A-W-E, that comes particularly for me in the Aru Pajana. I don't have to make it another event in that sequence. Mm -hmm. And what your, de your description of not taking ownership or making it mine is actually very helpful for someone to reflect on occasionally in trying to get used to the third Arupajana. Because it's exactly that kind of choice that allows someone to not identify with either pole of the subject object and not to engage with the ownership of this object or myself as a subject. And then you're very close when that becomes affected to the threshold of perception where the whole problem of mm. taking ownership disappears. It doesn't belong to you anymore. Mm -hmm. And these, these things, you know, you, you, you cannot really understand from the book. So all the, all the stuff that I remember reading in the early years in the Bisuddhi Magga, um, Ultimately, they may be, they may help set up a, a kind of direction, but ultimately the experience and direct understanding is completely different and can be very quick, which is what's really meant by the understanding of dependent origination arising in a single moment. Not the words that studying, remembering all those links and thinking are true. Something about the process, including what you just described and other people have tried to describe, is the same, the same thing. Finally, not engaging with, with that opens up a new way, but you don't disappear. It's, it's a different kind of...
You know, the neither perception nor yet it's not non-perception either. It's a very intriguing um, situation. Peter? Just a phrase, there's somewhere in the suttas where it says that the four Rupa Jhanas and the first three Arupas are all doors to the deathless. There's a door there. <laughs> You're familiar with this side of the door, but there's a door there. All your habits connect you to this side of the door, but there's a door there. And then? Go through it. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> um. Miranda? Um, my Boon Man, back in the days when he was actually teaching um, during a, his <coughs> times at Green Street, would introduce at one point jumping from one jhana to another, sometimes quite dramatically. And I well remember when we, he took us to um, the last uh, Aru Pajana. And then suddenly we were back on the fourth Rupa Jhana, which, which had a really amazing effect on me at the time. Um, and today in the practice, I found myself, I mean, obviously he directed it. So it was different from being self-directed. Uh, Today I found that I was moving about um, without kind of planning, but for instance, um, in the second Arupajana, I felt a sense of joy and I thought, okay, I'll go back to the second Arupajana. And that kind of thing was happening quite a lot throughout the practice. Mm. And, uh, you haven't mentioned jumping around like that. I just wondered. It was interesting. Um, I think probably when I got to the, fifth, the fourth Arupajana, I realised I wasn't quite in it. So I then went back to what I thought was appropriate for that. Mm -hmm. And so it went on. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 it didn't really, it wasn't really, um, it was just like being very mindful, I suppose. Mm. But it almost happened um, automatically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that is interesting that it was happening almost automatically. And yet there is a kind of, there is a kind of impulsion there so, somehow in that that was working okay for you because you, you, you clocked that the movement came from the um, second arrow pajana or the second the joy. You're making the link and your mind wants to explore it a bit more. So you're right on the threshold, but you aren't totally removed because you can go back in. This is the this is a very interesting way of practicing that Bhuman introduced and it's part of what in the Yoga Vachara is used to really understand the jhanas by exactly that kind of moving between them. Sometimes uh, in a direct order, like the first or the fourth, uh, or, or in reverse order, you know, intending to go straight to maybe the fourth and then back to the first, or to jump, or to move between the Rupa Rupa Um Yes, it's something I've mentioned, but not really made a great deal of in these talks. But I'm quite aware that a lot of people know about this. And it is very, very helpful to to clarify your understanding, because there is that interesting comparison. Yeah. And you've got the extra level of comparison today. When I was saying that the Rupa Jhanas give you a taste, but in a limited way, of the four paths, whereas the Arupa Jhanas give a experience 
potentially of the full experience of the path because it's unlimited. So there may at those points be an, in, be an impulse to, if one is not quite sure of how much one has let go into the Arupajana, to go back and then back in. So it can be a very helpful kind of practice. But again, how capable already is someone to do that without being pulled out back into too much thinking? Most people in this group can do that to some extent, and it can be really helpful. Beginners can be very confusing. Also, you realize when you do it that the mind has become very flexible in what it wants to do. And the choice or the impulse can be so simple that it just takes you there. So the mind becomes very workable. And that begins to that start in the first Rupa Jhana, when we separate from too much thinking from sensory consciousness. Even in the beginnings of the first Rupa Jhana around the threshold, the person starts to notice that the mind is, is, is very free to think creatively. And, and actually, it's possible to get quite uh, attached to that and not go deeper in jhana, not to fully develop the first rupa jhana. And then you may not really go into what it could, what's possible for you. I haven't said much about it, but the first rupa jhana seems to me to be a really, really important uh, stage for a meditator to get really familiar with because the 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 tendency to pop out and think and then realize that the thinking is, is very interesting it's very easy to think to think that this is this is the full experience of jhana and if you think back to the way sensory consciousness works, it, like the dependent origination, it's reinforcing. Each time you go around a loop, if it's fueled by um, happiness, you might get more happiness. If it's fueled by fear, you might get more fear. So the, the, the psychic nature is, is actually very two-sided. It can reinforce a strength of concentration or understanding, it can also reinforce a, a, a negative result. And if a, if a meditator is somehow um, very strongly ex expecting to experience what he thinks Johnny would be like, then it may well be that the experience appears to that meditator like Johnny and they become stuck at that point. A kind of cognitive facsimile jhana. So the first Rupa jhana, I think, is very important to be patient with it. So I'm mentioning this because of a lot of teachers here. When you're teaching, there's a lot more to understand about that threshold that we're talking about today, about the threshold into the first jhana, but then into our Rupa jhana, then finally into the path. Um, but it starts with the first Rupa jhana to really take time to understand uh, what it is that's happening, what, what choice and what letting go really mean. I mean, it's a really interesting insight from the neuroscience and the Buddhist view of this of the cycle, the way it can be reinforcing, because it connects very strongly to mental health problems that if an experience becomes so compelling, it becomes repeated and repeated, even if, it's, even if it's disastrous for a person in mental health. And also, I think it's very, very important to think about for old age, because I notice that um, there's a tendency sometimes with old age to become drawn into rumination. And it depends on the containment of the family and circumstances, whether that's a kind of positive rumination or more negative, or, or just very confusing. So that cycle can become hooked on a, a repetitive neg negative 
mode. And in meditation, we're trying to, in a way, stop that repetitive cycle right from the beginning. Right from the very, very beginning when we set up mindfulness, we bring the mind back to the number. If we're forgetting the next number. So this cyclical thing is, um, it, it may seem like a bit of an offshoot, but I find it fascinating. And I'm sure it's of interest to, um, to for example, Francis in working with um, older patients, as it is with me. So rambling on a bit now, I'm afraid that's what happens after 12 o'clock. So I think it's time to sign off. Um, thank you for um, being interested in these talks, and I'm sure something will follow at some point. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank, thank you Paul. so much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.